Afternoon, Dr. Hackney. Uh, hi, Andrew. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. <clears throat> I just visited uh, Dr. Hines, although she doesn't have much space, and I'm sure her office is not any more like really prepared than mine is. It looks really nice. She is just such an organized person. Yeah, she is. I need to like step up my game when it comes to organization. Luckily, with this view just from my computer camera, you can't see what a disaster my office actually is. I am uh, Andrew. Are you still there? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm pausing the recording so it just doesn't have a bunch of recordings so far. When people look at the recording, uh, they're going to see you and Mary doing whatever you're doing before the meeting starts. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, yeah, Andrew was reminding me, you know, to make sure that the recording is on so I'll be able to post this and you'll be able to review it if you want. Uh, um, anytime you want over the course of the semester. Uh, but uh, what I had started to say is a couple of people uh, working with me in the clinic in ICE uh, met an actual patient uh, the uh, last Thursday, but I can't remember who they were. Just yell your name if you are one of those students who met the patient with me. It's gonna be working the next couple of, days, a couple of weeks with this patient. It was Casey and Liz. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Okay. So, uh, Casey, I, I saw Casey's name here. I think Casey is here. Uh, and Liz, I actually see Liz's face. Hi, Liz. Um, so, uh, you can share some of your experiences uh, with your classmates you know, as it uh, comes up. Well, uh, almost everybody is here. So, I'm going to go ahead and get started. There's a lot of slides. Uh, but a lot of it is just things for you to look at and to keep. So if you meet uh, a patient with amputation, you have kind of a uh, place to start so far as what sort of exercises you might apply and why. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for the first lecture. That's it, but uh, go back here to share a screen. And, and there we are. Okay, so can you see the PowerPoint? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Okay, good. All right, um, so uh, I uh, have been uh, leading this course, um, this was a, actually the very first course, I think I may have mentioned this to you, uh, but this is the very first course that I led as I started with Missouri State in the summer of 2007. Uh, the prosthetics programming uh, was done by a guy named Fred Larrick, uh, who is um, still at Cox. He is uh, mainly administrative and he was really instrumental. Cox. Um, in the past few years actually built and opened their own uh, prosthetics and orthotics laboratory and that was uh, spearheaded by Fred. Uh, has anybody um, actually met Fred? Give me, again there's gestures that you can do, get a thumbs up or a wave uh, to tell me if you've met Fred. Uh, but anyway Fred was uh, doing this before um, and I've uh, updated a lot of times because, you know, especially in the realm of prostheses, uh, there's a lot of new cool things that have happened. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Fred for uh, constructing this in the first place. 
Anyway, why was that mess? We'll do it that way. Okay. Um, so, who has uh, lower extremity amputations? Um, uh, here are, and I don't need to read this to you, I'll just kind of point out the highlights. Um, so, the foot and ankle amputations are really, they usually do not work as well uh, as uh, the transtibial amputation. Uh, sometimes people have to have a transfemoral amputation as well, but the uh, transtibial we'll talk about more, and that's uh, way more common uh, than foot and ankle. A lot of people have their like, toes cut off, uh, and if it's not the great toe, uh, then the consequences uh, to gait are not that bad. If they are the great toe, then they really lose out on that four-foot rocker, because hopefully, as you remember, uh, from both anatomy and kinesiology, uh, the flexor halsus longus is way stronger uh, than all the rest of the long toe flexors combined. Okay, knee disarticulation um, is, is a little bit more common, but it's still pretty rare. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, even though you have, if you have knee disarticulation, you have the femoral condyles, which are really good weight-bearing surface, but um, what we try to do generally is to have the prosthetic knee at about the same level in space as the sound knee on the other side. Uh, and if a patient has a knee disarticulation, uh, then the prosthetic knee is going to be a bit lower than the other side, and it leads to a fairly asymmetrical gait. There's transfemoral hip and pelvis, rather rare, and bilateral, again, rare. So the uh, main things that we're gonna be talking about are when we talk about uh, prostheses uh, and, the, um, and the treatments uh, for amputation uh, are the foot and ankle, most commonly the transmetatarsal amputation, and the transtibial and the transfemoral. So for a total, and uh, I had updated these stats um, a few years ago, so as of 2011, of a little bit more than a million lower extremity amputations in the United States, most of them, the plurality of them being of the toes. Okay, so the, the, there's actually some interesting statistics that kind of coincide. Uh, and when you look at it at first, you might think, well, how can those two things, those two statistics, both be true? Uh, but it's important to think about how they are. So we're gonna, I'm going to actually ask you to think about why these things can be true. But just vascular reasons or disease, including diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, uh, are the main things, are the, by far the most frequent reason that people have amputation, lower extremity amputation, in the United States as well as the developed world, in like the Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, et cetera. Uh, trauma uh, is much more rare. Uh, now, what is really interesting, and perhaps you've encountered this, um, uh, that um, people will have amputation as a result of uh, central nervous system problems, such as uh, coma due to op opioid, opioid uh, overdose, uh, and uh, other central nervous uh, traumatic brain injury, um, uh, and things where uh, they need to put the person in a medically induced coma. Uh, one of the main things that's administered to do this is dopamine, and what dopamine does is it shunts, uh, first of all, uh, a medically induced coma uh, will slow down the metabolism of the uh, the neurons, and the neurons have a really high metabolic de demand. So if there is insufficient perfusion, uh, then uh, those neurons can be damaged by their own metabolic demand. So in order to spare the brain, we decrease the, um, the perfusion 
of the brain uh, with uh, medically induced coma. Uh, uh, and what LSAT does is it shunts the blood from the limbs to the vital organ. So uh, what happens frequently, and I didn't used to understand this, so I had to study a little bit to find out what was going on, uh, is that um, uh, people who have this sort of problem, for instance, um, meningitis, uh, will end up with lower extremity amputation because of the compromise of the circulation of the lower extremities, especially most distal lower extremities. So their toes and their feet uh, will become gangrenous. Another thing that happens uh, with trauma uh, is late amputations after attempted limb salvage due to life-threatening bacterial infection. So I've met a couple people uh, who have had really severe limb injury. Uh, they attempt to do it, but then uh, they come down to the choice of either we do amputation right now to stop this infection, or the person is going to die. Uh, so that is uh, another cause, you know, in addition to uh, amputation by the accident itself, another cause of amputation uh, sometimes several weeks after an initial injury. And rarely there is congenital amputation, uh, and tumor, again, is rarely, is pretty rare. Um, tumor is again, kind of an interesting convergence of statistics. Um, uh, primary bone uh, cancers are fairly rare, uh, as a number of cancers that occur, and childhood cancer is rare too. But among childhood cancers, uh, tumors of the bone are actually pretty common. Uh, as a matter of fact, for a reason that we're gonna talk about in a couple weeks, um, primary tumors of the bone are almost exclusively the domain of skeletally immature people. Uh, you can look in the medical literature and find an example of everything you could possibly imagine happening at least once, but primary uh, bone tumors, uh, not including metastatic bone tumors, primary bone tumors that started in the bone are mainly the domain of the skeletal the skeletal, skeletally immature. Okay, so most patients with amputation are male. Uh, now here's an interesting thing, and this is the first thing that I'd like you to think about um, uh, this morning. This would be a huddle session if we were together, uh, is that uh, the plurality of people who have amputation uh, are over 40, are over 60, well, actually, uh, let's go back. The plurality of, but let's look at the age of people who are living with amputation. Uh, so 40% over 60, 35% uh, between 40 and 60, uh, and 25% under 40. Now, let's look at the age at which amputations happen. Okay, so 35% of lower extremity amputations happen with people uh, of 75 years of age or older. 28% uh, happen uh, between 74 and 65. So if you put that together, uh, and there's the next couple age groups, but if you put this together and um, give me a thumbs up. Can you see my cursor? I want to point things. Can you see the cursor? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so if you put these two sets of statistics together, uh, what you have here is at 65% um, of, yeah, that's right, 65% of the, let me do this in fact. Oh, that's a guy in that blue color. There we go. Okay, so 65%, I'll go like this to make it clear what I'm talking about. 65% uh, of the people who um, are living with amputation are, shoot. well, let me go back on that, forgive me, I said that wrong. There we 
All right, let's try this again. Okay, so we put this together. This is Oh well, 60% um, of the people who are living with uh, amputation, so here's a group of 60 to 41, and here's the next group of 40 and under. So that's 60%. 60% of the people who are living with amputation uh, are uh, <clears throat> under, are 60 years or under. Got it? 60% are 60 years or under. But over here, um, 63% of the people who have amputation are over 65. Okay, now this is what I'd like you to think about. Um, how can those two statistics both be true? They seem kind of contradictory, don't they? Uh, but they aren't, and there is a way and, and really something that's really important for you to understand in which they're both true. So of people who are living with amputation, 65% um, are uh, between the ages of 40 and 61. Um, oh, shoot, let's say that again. Our 60%, forgive me, 60% are between the ages of 40 and 61. Uh, and 63% uh, of all amputations are done with people over the age of 65. So think about this and chat to me, how can these both be true simultaneously? And I'll tell you what, you can, um, you can send messages to each other, right? Uh, so if you want to think about it together, send messages to each other. And I'll let you think about this for a minute. Okay, good. All right, so there's been a few answers and those answers have been really good. Uh, so what happens is that this group of people, 65 and older, remember that the main reason that they have amputation in the first place is because of um, dysvascular disease. So if they have diabetes, well, diabetes causes a lot of other problems. Uh, it's associated with uh, coronary uh, artery disease, it's associated with kidney failure, um, and, and as well as high blood pressure is associated with kidney failure. Um, and if you have uh, coronary artery disease and or excuse me if you have peripheral vascular disease and likely you have coronary artery disease as well uh, so what happens with this population here that I just uh, uh, circled is a lot of them die shortly after their amputation uh, and then for this reason the people who are the majority of people who are actually living with amputation actually. So the majority of people who are actually living uh, with amputation, there we go, who are here, there we go, are younger.
erase this. Hey, Dr. Hagney. Yes. So someone who is older and has uh, amputation due to diabetes and such will have a shorter life expectancy. Exactly. But if it's uh, someone who's younger and maybe they had a motor vehicle accident and had to have a leg amputated, does their life expectancy change compared to the general population at all? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, perhaps. But, um, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. That's an interesting question. Okay, so who has amputations? Um, so um, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans have a higher incidence than non-Hispanic white population, uh, but Native Americans have by far the highest incidence of amputation. Uh, 3.5 times that of non-Hispanic whites. Now, I uh, actually had contacted uh, Dr. Himes and um, Chihoy. Dr. Himes is actually on campus. I hadn't heard back from her uh, at the time of this, uh, by the time we started this morning. Uh, but um, we used to have, and I'm not sure if we still do, but we used to have uh, some clinical internships with the Indian Health Service. Both of those were in Arizona. Uh, and so if somebody was really interested in working this, with this population, uh, then that would be a, uh, one of the clinicals that you might be interested in pursuing. Okay, so most people who have an amputation that can be treated with the prosthesis use that prosthesis all day long, but that's actually a good question as well, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So we talked about K levels. A uh, show of hands if you remember talking about what K levels are. Okay, so most of your people are nodding, yes, you remember K levels. So the K level uh, is actually a predictor of uh, whether a patient is going to be using a prosthesis uh, and if they are, how much they're going to be depending upon that prosthesis and what they're going to use that prosthesis for. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the amputation surgeries. Okay. So, um, as we talked about before, um, most amputations are done for dysvascular reasons. Um, Midfoot amputations, which isn't the same as a transmetatarsal amputation. Transmetatarsal amputation, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, is actually fairly common uh, and done for dysvascular reasons. The midfoot amputations are the Lisfranc and the Chopard amputation, uh, and that's rarely done, period, uh, but almost never done for dysvascular reasons. Hip disarticulation, the same thing, usually done for tumor or sometimes major trauma. Okay, so uh, at what level uh, should the amputation be? Usually the main reason for that uh, is for having to do with circulation. So they'll do it um, uh, either um, transtibial, uh, if the circulation uh, of the lower leg is fairly good, or transfemoral if it is not. Uh, so the things that are considered uh, when thinking about the level of amputation are the length of the moment arm, uh, the torque relationships, and the shape of the re residual limb uh, for facilitation of a functional uh, prosthesis. And we'll talk more about that over the next few minutes. So what we have here though, on the right side of the screen, uh, is a diagram. So if you can imagine that this top oval is the thigh, and the bottom oval is what we call the residual limb, uh, after amputation of the shank. So the knee is right about here, right? Uh, so this is the external moment arm of knee flexion. And that external moment arm of knee flexion is applied to especially the bottom of the residual limb of the shank. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
the longer this moment arm is, the more knee torque it causes. Okay, so we'll go through the, this next part pretty rapidly, and this is just how the amputations are named uh, based upon where they are. Uh, and how this diagram goes uh, is uh, if hip disarticulation is what it sounds like, uh, but a hemipelvectomy is not necessarily the whole half of the pelvis, pelvis or the whole innominate bone, but part of the pelvis. Uh, now, uh, if you have these very short amputations, uh, then you end up with a residual limb that can generate less and less torque uh, to operate a prosthesis. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, um, but you know, if somebody was just to have, I'll show you with my cursor here, if somebody was just to have this part of the femur, uh, then they're likely not to be able to really use that because they would have to generate so much torque. And besides, you know, what all do they have attaching here? They have, uh, they don't have very much of the glute max at all. So they don't have really much hip extension. They don't even have hip flexion because they've lost uh, the lesser trochanter. So that would not be a very functional level of prosthesis or a functional level of amputation. Uh, these are more common. Uh, again, the knee disarticulation you think would be more common because it gives patients a pretty nice weight bearing surface, but you know, just because of the constraints of the um, uh, of the construction of prostheses, you have to have a mechanical knee somewhere. Uh, and if the mechanical knee is much lower than the the biological knee on the sound side, then the gait is really asymmetrical. Okay, so here are the levels that we think about with transtibial. Um, the reason that you don't see it very long, very frequently, and I'll go ahead and mention this to you, uh, is because you don't have the gastrocnemius. Uh, the gastroc is really, really important for shaping the residual limb, so it is really good for fitting within the socket uh, and operating uh, prosthesis with. So this is why you have this standard length. Now, if it's too short, again, you have a little, you sort of have a knee joint, but you have such a short limb that you can't really uh, uh, generate much torque with it. Uh, and so it might not be that useful for a patient. Okay, now in the last century and perhaps early in the 20th century, uh, the signs amputation was popular. Uh, so the fellow in the uh, etching here is James Sign, uh, who invented this amputation. And what goes on with this amputation is it's an ankle uh, disarticulation. Uh, so the surgeon would remove the foot, bevel off the malleoli, uh, but take the heel pad from the foot and graft it to the bottom of this residual limb. So you know, alleged, So on the one hand, the patient has a good weight bearing surface and allegedly the patient could actually ambulate a little bit without the prosthesis. Now the prosthesis is especially unattractive prosthesis as you see here. Not done very frequently uh, these days because, and I'll go ahead and introduce the idea to you, some really important things are built into the pylon uh, of the uh, prosthesis for people with transtibial amputation. So I think we talked about this a little bit before, but let me unshare the screen a little bit so I can show you something uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, so this is a prosthesis for somebody with transtibial amputation, and this here is the pylon. Uh, and we're going to talk about over the next couple weeks some really important things that can facilitate effective gait with a person can be built into the pylon. Uh, 
Okay. Can you see the screen again? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, so here is a transmetatarsal amputation, and pretty much what it sounds like. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty proximal on the metatarsals. Uh, and uh, I'll be sure to show this to you uh, next time we meet. Um, but a lot of people were, uh, while you were preparing for the, uh, for the lab exam, were looking at one of the pictures and seeing something that they didn't, uh, they didn't recognize. Uh, it was a little short black orthosis. And that, uh, if you remember that, what that was for, and again, I'll show this to you. In fact, I can, I'm sure I can track it down. We'll break in about 20 minutes uh, so that you can have a little break from this and also for fluid balancing, as Dr. Cook would say. Uh, but what uh, that prosthesis, or what that orthosis rather was for, was for somebody who had had a transmetatarsal amputation while they're resting post-surgically to help uh, prevent uh, plantar flexion contracture. The reason that a transmetatarsal amputation isn't done that frequently is plantar flexion contracture. Um, so what you will learn over the past, or over the next week or so, uh, is that the surgical technique uh, really makes a big difference in whether the person has a uh, good function as an ambulator. Uh, so what this does is it shortens the moment arm of the foot, uh, and uh, they can potentially lose the medial support of the transverse longitudinal arches. Uh, we'll talk about that more when we talk about the um, processes that we have for people with this. But the plantar flexion contracture comes because over here you still have uh, the strongest of the plantar flexors, the uh, triceps surrey attaching on the calcaneus, uh, but you have removed the major dorsiflexors. You know, certainly you've removed most of the tibialis anterior, or perhaps you've removed the tibialis anterior, but you've definitely removed the long toe extensors. Uh, and hopefully you guys remember that although you can extend your toes with your long toe extensors, especially the extensor digitorum longus, that's not what they do in gait. What they do in gait, the extensor digitorum longus especially, uh, is serve as a dorsiflexor everter simultaneously. Uh, so if you have a contraction because you don't have uh, the uh, muscle tension of the triceps surrey opposed, then you might still get some dorsiflexion with inversion, but you have no dorsiflexion with eversion in patients like this end up with, on the one hand, the foot pointed down into plantar flexion, and on the other hand, uh, the foot in inversion. Anyway, it's not really very useful for walking when it's in that shape. So what is important uh, with a patient like this is that the uh, long toe extensors, namely uh, the extensor uh, digitorum longus, uh, is grafted onto the metatarsal heads or grafted somewhere on the dorsal side so that the patient still has some opposing muscle tension uh, to be able to control this shortened foot. Okay, so you remember uh, talking about the Lis Franc joint. I think we talked about that in. Um, uh, in uh, kinesiology, uh, perhaps you talked about it in uh, anatomy. Uh, did you talk about the Lis Franc joint in uh, musculoskeletal? Okay, but this is the Lis Franc joint. The Lis Franc joint uh, is where the metatarsals meet the midfoot or these tarsal bones, uh, the cuboid and the cuneiforms. Uh, and this is the Chopar joint. The Chopar joint uh, is where the hind foot, the calcaneus, and the, uh, and the talus, the head of the talus, uh, meets the midfoot. And what do you notice about both of those names? Go ahead and chat me. Liz Franck and Chopar. Okay, there's a first chat came through. I'll let a couple people have a crack at that question. Uh, 
Okay, yep, that's true. So all those, <laughs> I like that Cameron said, Viva la France. Okay, yes indeed, so they're French names. So both of these guys uh, were field generals uh, for Napoleon. Uh, and there's a couple of things, a couple of stories how these amputations came to be, but certainly one of the things that Napoleon did was attempt to invade Russia. So he went to invade Russia in the late summer and the weather was not too bad. The Russian army kept falling back and falling back and falling back. Uh, and then Napoleon's forces was all stretched out across Russia and then the winter came. Uh, and the Russians said, ha, it's November and you're in Siberia, suckers. Uh, and so there was really high incidence of frostbite uh, amongst the soldiers. So we have these amputations of the feet for among other reasons uh, to help with the frostbite. So these amputations uh, would save the lives of the victims of this frostbite. Uh, however, they wouldn't be very good for weight bearing because again, certainly there's no way to avoid plantar flexion contracture uh, if uh, a patient has a Lisbronk or a Chopar amputation because there's nothing pulling the foot back up in the first place. Okay, so as we said before, uh, so far as the functional outcome, none of these procedures is as good as a well-done transtibial amputation. Again, uh, because we can make a, uh, we as a medical community uh, can make a really good uh, and really functional transtibial prosthesis. Okay, so what they need to do uh, with uh, amputation, the bone has to be transected and beveled because if it's just transected, then the edges are sharp and is going to cut through uh, tissue. Uh, nerves are transected and nerves. I actually have a video, a YouTube video of amputations, which doesn't sound very good, uh, but I really want you guys to like put on your big boy and big girl pants uh, and look at these videos uh, because it's really important and it's really impressive to see uh, when these amputations are done, how much the goal is really um, it is really in mind as they do this. So they do the amputations, the people, the surgeons who are really good at doing them, they do the amputations uh, with the goal of the person being a good uh, user of a prosthesis and a really functional user of a prosthesis when they come out on the other end of their uh, rehabilitation. So nerves are elastic and you'll see that what the surgeon does is pull the nerve way out and then snip it so it retracts way back into the muscle. Uh, the muscles and soft tissues are carefully modeled, uh, again, for the sake of the shape of the residual nerve or the residual limb when it's all healed. Uh, myodesis is surgical creation of an artificial muscle attachment. Uh, and that's really especially important in the case of uh, transfemoral amputation, which we'll talk uh, myoplasty is the remodeling of muscle tissue for residual limb shape and tissue pressure. Uh, and then closure, closure of, the, um, of the fascial planes and the skin. Okay, and here is the link, and you know, I'll let you watch it on your own, but it's really important. It's really good. It's really interesting. It's not really appetizing but it's still really important for you guys, I think, to understand all the care that is taken uh, by the surgeon to make sure that when we're finished, uh, we end up with a really functional residual limb. Okay, and this is a photo of a, uh, a recently post-surgical residual limb. Uh, if you look at this here, there's these little corners, and sometimes you see this, but less frequently than they used to. So what surgeons do now, uh, and what you'll see if you look at this video is that the surgeon models the skin really closely to really minimize this effect of a corner uh, on either end of the residual limb after transtibial amputation. Um, what we want uh, is for the 
fibula to be almost as long as the tibia uh, that really facilitates a good shape. Uh, and also what we do with the residual limb, uh, we being including physical therapy, but this would be more the prosthetist who's constructing, uh, is trying to apply um, uh, torques in the frontal plane. So trying to apply a varus moment, and we'll talk a bunch about this over the next week or so, a varus moment with the prosthesis upon the residual limb. So if you're trying to uh, apply a varus moment, then over here you just have this pointy fibula uh, that is not uh, a very good pressure bearing structure as opposed to over here, you have the shaft of the fibula, which is a little better. There's your varus moment. And there it's effective because it's going to the shaft of the fibula rather than this transecting point. Okay, now uh, myodinesis after transfemoral amputation, uh, and here I have another link of transfemoral amputation, uh, is even more important because um, it, we actually talked a little bit uh, in the first unit uh, how um, with a transtibular amputation, the main weight-bearing structure is the patellar tendon. Uh, but we don't have that with the transfemoral amputation. There's actually more weight-bearing going on through the distal end of the transected femur. Uh, and so on the one hand, uh, muscles and tendons are, are attached to it to make it more resilient so it doesn't cut through the skin and the connective tissue. And also, it's really interesting, uh, people with transfemoral amputation are probably the only people who are susceptible to abductor contracture. So you may have let, met little old people in nursing homes uh, who spend so much time in wheelchairs that they get abduction contractures, uh, and that's not unusual, but these are people who, who can actually get abduction contractures because you've got all that force of the adductor magnus uh, if it is not myoidesed onto the uh, femur, uh, then there is no force to help keep the femur adducted. Okay, now here is something really interesting. Let me see how much time I have. Okay, I have a few minutes. We'll be able to finish this. Dr. Uh, uh, yeah. One more time, Could you did you say that these patients are more susceptible to adductor contracture? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> no is the short answer to your question. These are patients who are actually susceptible to abduction contractures. And they're the only people, to my knowledge, who can get abduction contractures. But abduction contractures with patients after transfemoral amputation uh, is a common and important problem. One of the things that is done to help prevent that is myodesis uh, on, uh, from the adductor magnus, which is what you see on this drawing here, uh, onto the distal femur, because otherwise uh, that adductor magnus would be just flapping in the breeze and not accomplishing anything. Um, it's really interesting, we're gonna talk about it more uh, but the adductors work with these patients in a way that they don't have to work with anybody else in the world. So remember, usually the adductor torque uh, with us, with our sound legs and feet, come from gravity. Uh, but as you're going to see with this next slide, um, and, and this is really a great slide, uh, so here is a patient with a transfemoral amputation and stabbing uh, and a radiograph. So we see that the femur uh, is just kind of waving in space and indeed it's abducted. Uh, and this is with uh, a standard type of prosthesis with the socket. And you can see that they're even trying uh, to prevent that. So what you see, the reason there's all this space in here uh, is that the socket is designed uh, to actually grab on to the ischial tuberosity uh, in order to keep the femur adducted against the lateral wall of the socket. But we see even with that, it doesn't work so well. 
So what we have over here is something really, really wild. Now, a year or two ago, when I was teaching this class, a student, a young man, I, I can't remember who it was, but came up to me and said, hey, Dr. Heckney, what do you think of osteointegration? I said, what? It says, oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's uh, the prosthesis is attached straight to the bone. I said, ah, no, that can't be, that can't be, that can't be. Uh, but then uh, at this past CM, CSM in Denver, uh, this past February, I learned about this. Now, there's a few uh, programs uh, that do this throughout the world, and we'll, we'll talk about this. There's a couple here in the United States, and we're going to have a little bit of talk about this, but this is really cool. So this is actually the same patient under a couple situations. So here we see the patient in a socket, and we see that the femur, here the femur on the sound side is a deducted like it's supposed to be. The femur on the uh, amputated side uh, is abducted uh, within this soft tissue envelope. But over here, there's a stem, and there's a really long stem, in fact, uh, with this type of prosthesis, a stem that's going up through the femur, uh, but, um, and then there is, and this is, this is wild, but there is this metal interface that comes from the skin, uh, from the bone through the skin, and attaches straight, straight to the prosthesis. But one of the cool things that's going on uh, is that it's keeping the femur adducted like it's supposed to, right? Okay, so we're almost finished uh, with this uh, discussion, uh, but here is probably a trauma surgeon uh, thought that, okay, with amputation, you want to preserve the knee, so I think I can preserve the knee. What do you think? Did this trauma surgeon do this patient a big favor uh, by preserving the knee. Go ahead and chat me. Okay, and Mary said, and Mary was right, no. Uh, okay, so another chat question. Why, and, and so, Thumbs up for Mary, because you're absolutely correct. Uh, why uh, the knee is there, right? Why didn't the trauma surgeon do that patient a big favor by, present, by preserving the knee? I want to see your ideas. Okay. Okay, so risk of knee flexion contracture, perhaps. But, oh, there we go, so Spencer. Uh, what Spencer said is an even better answer, that the residual limb is so small uh, that you would not be able to generate enough torque in order to control the prosthesis. So probably what happened with this patient, and this is, looks like a pretty bad femoral fracture, but eventually this was revised, I'm guessing, uh, to, a, um, uh, to a transfemoral amputation, then this patient would actually be able to operate the prosthesis. Okay, and that will do us for this section. Let's go ahead and take a little break uh, until two o'clock. Uh, and then um, we'll be able to finish before three. The next um, uh, PowerPoint has a lot of slides, but we'll really go through most of them. Most of them are just, you know, I, I think, things that will be helpful to know if you're working with patients and give you uh, some sort of starter ideas uh, for patients depending upon when you're working with them. Uh, but we don't have to talk about every single slide, so that'll go pretty fast. Okay, so go ahead, let's break until two. Uh, any questions as we part company for a little bit? You can yell them out or chat me. No? Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna find that gizmo that I was talking about uh, and uh, you can take a little break for just a little bit.
Okay, let's see. Uh, time to get started again. And again, I would love to see as many faces as I could. Uh, there were a couple things that I was looking for over the break. Um, I wasn't able to find both of them, but I was able to find this. Uh, so this, uh, some of you saw uh, on that uh, PowerPoint that you're looking at preparing for the lab exam, but this is a little orthosis uh, for a patient uh, after transmitter tarsal amputation, probably for resting to help prevent plantar flexion contracture. And you can tell that it's for a patient with transmitter tarsal amputation rather than just somebody with amazingly short wide feet. Uh, because of what is right here. You can see that this is the styloid for the fifth metatarsal. So here's a styloid for the fifth metatarsal, uh, and then the fifth metatarsal would actually end somewhere right about here. All right? Okay. So uh, there's one more thing that I was looking for that I wasn't able to find, but it's actually, I think, conceptually pretty easy. Uh, and I'll show it to you next time. It'll come up uh, several times. Um, so let me go ahead and share with you my screen. So this is a PowerPoint, uh, but it'll go really, really quickly. There we are. Dr. Hackney. Yes. Which PowerPoint is this? Is this on Blackboard? It's not on Blackboard yet. I okay. need Okay, that's, I'm glad you asked that question. It's not on Blackboard yet. Have you ever tried, have you ever made and saved a PowerPoint? You know, this has probably never happened to you, but this has happened to me a few times. I've made and saved PowerPoints and say, uh, okay, let me put it on Blackboard, then I can't find them. Then I go back uh, to, um, to look for them and say, okay, it should be there, and then I go to attach it in Blackboard and I can't find it. So um, I will try as soon as this is over. They're actually, you know, no, this isn't on Blackboard right now. Okay. Uh, but let me, I'll tell you what, it would probably be really helpful if you could follow along. So let me see if I can do that right now. Um, we'll take just a little bit of a break uh, while I am working on that. And we'll stop this and Let's uh, pause the recording a little bit. Okay, and I'll see if I can put either this or uh, uh, this is just has a couple of illustrations uh, more than the uh, than the version from before. So it's not really a big change, but I want to make things as easy for you as I can. Okay, there, we are in business. It is on Blackboard now. And I'm going to share my screen. And make it big. Oh, 
Okay, so like I said, there's lots and lots of slides in here, but they mostly go really quickly. I'll mostly only stop uh, to point out some things that are especially interesting or important. Okay, so uh, here are some of the first things that you're interested in uh, with uh, these patients. You're mainly trying to control edema uh, and watch out for signs of infection. As you might imagine, serosanguinous, that is clear and uh, with a little bit of blood drainage is normal immediately postoperatively uh, because, <coughs> forgive me, uh, the pressure inside that residual limb is really high. Okay, so um, some of the, the people, let's see, again, it was, um, uh, it was Liz and who else was with me? Um, on Thursday? I was. Okay, and Casey. Okay, listen, Casey, you were with me. Uh, and the patient had, uh, underneath the splint, he had a stump shrinker. Uh, and they, again, that expression stump is usually not used uh, for uh, talking about the residual limb, but there are some things uh, that uh, continue to have that. Whoop. I asked you to show your faces. There's mine. Okay, good. Uh, so um, Brant will, uh, Brant Sutton, who's the prosthetist that we work with, uh, in a few weeks when he visits the first time, he'll uh, bring some of those uh, stump shrinkers and show you how they're applied and give you a chance to try it, not with the living patient, but with some models. Uh, if they don't have a stump shrinker, there's an ace wrap. Uh, is used a lot of the time. And the ACE wrap is good, but there's two problems with it. First of all, it's a skill uh, and it's hard to learn. So we'll work with that a little bit. Uh, and then also it has to be redone a few times over the course of the day because it gets loose or, um, uh, or gets jumbled up and it's not accomplishing the compression that we wanted to. Um, the reason that we are doing ACE wrapping is, I think I mentioned, uh, we've had a, uh, a couple of clinical internships, I think, with the Indian Health Service, uh, and Native, Native Americans are by far uh, the most frequent group to suffer lower extremity amputations, and that's the way uh, they do uh, immediate edema control, and it would be edema control for actually several months after amputation. I heard a voice. Did somebody have something to add? Okay, uh, about, it varies depending upon where uh, in the country you are, but uh, Brandt describes that about uh, in Southwest Missouri, at least in the hospitals in Springfield, about half the people have rigid dressings after amputation. We'll describe a little bit about that. Uh, and then there's some alternatives to rigid dressings, but rigid dressings are casts, and casts are usually uh, a fiberglass rather than a plaster these days uh, over the uh, recently amputated residual limb. Okay, so this, um, Casey and Liz uh, saw this. The fellow that we met on uh, last Thursday had a device similar to this, a post-operative splint. Uh, so the ideas behind this are for uh, protection of the incision in case a person falls or bumps it, uh, or also, especially with patients, uh, after transtibial amputation, knee flexion contracture, which is really a problem uh, if the, page, if the patients uh, develop knee flexion contracture. Uh, here are some stump shrinkers uh, the one on the left, as you're looking at it, uh, is for um, the uh, transtibular amputation. The one on the right, it has a strap around the pelvis, so that's for transfemoral amputation. Uh, a rigid dressing, as I said, and I've got some examples of these, uh, but uh, they are casts uh, that the surgeon puts on uh, right after the surgery, and they're great for edema control, uh, shaping the residual limb and wound protection. Now, sometimes there can be a pressure uh, or a problem because of high pressure. Uh, if there's more edema that is expected, uh, you're unable to look at the wound 
uh, in pistonine can occur. So pistonine is the residual limb uh, moving in and out relative to uh, the dressing, and that can be a problem because remember, most of these people uh, have had the amputation in the first place because of uh, non-healing skin or tissue wounds. Uh, and if they get scratches from the pistonine, then they can really be reproducing the problem. I actually uh, worked with a patient, um, uh, it's been a few years, but I used to um, uh, work on the weekends mainly at, um, uh, at uh, a small hospital, um, uh, Ozark Community Hospital. So they actually had a hospital, I think it's mostly psychiatric now, but they did used to have orthopedic surgeries. It used to be more of a full service hospital. Uh, and so I saw a patient who had had transtibial amputation and then the orthopedic surgeon, who will remain nameless to protect the guilty, uh, went on vacation with his family to Disney World. Uh, and the pressure went down, way down uh, because the swelling went way down a few days after surgery and the thing fell off. And all the nurses were kind of panicky because you don't see many people with amputations and say, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? So they contacted the, the surgeon who was on vacation in Disney World and said, oh, don't worry about it, it'll be fine with nothing, just don't bother me, I'm on vacation. Uh, and so they contacted me and said, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I said, well, here's something you can do. And I showed them how to do the ACE wrapping uh, instead. But that's one more thing that, you, as you might imagine, can happen uh, is that, you know, the, the residual limb is very swollen at first. Uh, the swelling improves. The uh, rigid dressing can just fall off. Well, what you have then, though, is a removable rigid dressing. Uh, which is used sometimes, uh, again, to help control edema, shape the residual limb, and protect the wound. Okay, uh, and here, I don't have to go over this too much, but this is just a strategy for helping keep a residual, uh, a removable rigid dressing on. So the, the rigid dressing is just a cast. A lot of times it was the original cast uh, that was on the residual limb. Uh, a lot of times it's trimmed um, to make the edges smooth uh, and padded or bivalved, uh, and then they just use it for those uh, objectives that we were describing before. Okay, so compression is really important. Remember, what you want from compression uh, is that you want to uh, control edema uh, and you want to help uh, shape the residual limb so that it's good uh, for a socket, that it fits well into the socket, and is a good tool to control the prosthesis with. Uh, so you want the person to be independent with taking it on and putting it on and taking it off. You want it to stay in place. Uh, you want it to be adjustable so that it will actually help the residual limb shrink uh, and control the edema. Okay, now, um, this is something, uh, unfortunately, Liz and Casey won't be with me and this patient uh, who just had, well, had amputation four or five weeks ago, actually, uh, but won't be with me for that long and this patient uh, because they, like, switch you around pretty frequently. Uh, but one of the things to think about with patients like this uh, are if they're in the dependent position, and this patient described this, that a lot of times uh, he had a lot of pain with the dependent position. And the reason for that uh, is because they haven't recovered the vascular tone uh, within the residual limb. So it can swell up really, really rapidly. Uh, and that rapid swelling can happen uh, as long as six months after the surgery. So a lot of times, six months after surgery, the patients are actually using the prosthesis. But if the prosthesis is off and they have swelling, then they can't get the prosthesis on for the rest of the day. Uh, now, the fellow that we actually met on Thursday described that one of his problems was phantom limb pain. Uh, so for example, they might have pain of the foot. Well, they don't have a foot, 
how anymore, how can they have pain in the foot? Well, the reason is that they still have central representation of the foot or the leg or whatever has been amputated. Uh, and phantom limb pain is kind of um, mysterious, but to the best that we understand it, rather than being a peripheral uh, problem, it's actually a central nervous problem. It's nervous system problem. Uh, and it has to do with the representation of that limb uh, still existing within the brain. Okay. So what the research shows uh, is that the most productive type of therapy for phantom limb pain is mirror therapy. And we actually uh, Liz and Casey will remember that. We actually discussed this with this patient. He said, yeah, I tried it for a month. It didn't help at all. I said, well, you know, a month every day is a long time to try it. Uh, but uh, I've got a picture here of what uh, mirror therapy is. So here's this guy, and he's big and muscly, and he's almost certainly uh, a military veteran uh, who has lost his right leg. But with the mirror, it looks like he does have his right leg because his left leg is in good shape. Uh, so what the patients do is they touch the, uh, the, the sound leg uh, and they move the sound foot uh, and they look in the mirror at the other side. Uh, and this, uh, it is believes, helps them reprogram their central nervous system uh, so that they no longer have the sensation uh, from a limb or a limb segment that isn't there anymore. Sorry about the sound effects, that was Fred, Fred's idea. Okay, so what do we seek to accomplish with pre-prosthetic treatment? Uh, and uh, this mean maintenance of adequate range of motion is especially important. Um, I think that there may be some of you in this class who worked with Dr. Shah and I uh, in a project where we're looking at uh, what exercises is best for hip flexor stretching after patients, with patients uh, after uh, transtibial amputation. Um, however, uh, if the limbs are very short, say for instance that somebody has a very uh, short thigh after transfemoral amputation, Usually, you can stretch your thigh out with a tom or a stretch your hip flexor out with the Thomas position uh, by letting the leg hang off the edge of a bed or off the foot, end of, foot edge of a bed. Uh, however, if you have a very short uh, residual limb, then that is generating very little torque uh, and you're unable to get very much stretching. Uh, a therapist or somebody else would have a tough time helping you uh, because if you put your, if a therapist were to put his or her hand right where that, um, that incision is, if it is acute as in the past like couple months really, probably the patient will not allow you to do it because it'll just hurt too much. So we want to improve strength uh, all over, uh, both for the uh, the involved limb, let's go back here, both for the involved limb and for everything else. Increase activity, improve balance. And the improving balance is an interesting thing because now that they're missing a limb, the inertial characteristics of their body has changed. And this is actually one of the things that I want to, you to think about. So for instance, if somebody has had a transfemoral amputation on the right side, uh, then their actual center of mass of their body is going to move upward because they don't have a right lower limb anymore, and they move to the left. Okay, so the proprioception is an important thing uh, because, you know, although uh, the osteointegration is very cool, it's very rare. I talked to Brandt, uh, I saw him um, uh, right before the sem semester started, and he says he's heard and he's, he's read and he's seen about osteointegration, although he has never actually met a patient. Here in the United States, there's two programs. There's a Department of Defense program, which I think is based in Walter Reed. Uh, and then there's a program out of the University of Utah. So you know, we're unlikely to meet any of those patients here in Southwest Missouri in the meantime. So 
uh, all the patients with amputation that we're actually going to be working are have their their prosthesis, the interface between their body and their prosthesis is the socket, right? Uh, so whereas for us, uh, when we're standing, we feel um, the shift of our center of mass through the center of foot pressure, patients uh, with amputation no longer can feel that because they don't have a foot. So instead they feel the change uh, as a difference uh, of pressure of the residual limb within the socket. So they have to relearn what those sensations within the socket mean uh, for their body position and the position of their uh, prosthetic side relative to the ground. Okay, so we talked about this a couple times before, but this is a really important uh, idea uh, when it comes to working with patients with prostheses. Uh, a K0 to K level. So the K0 is somebody who will not use a prosthesis at all. K1 is household ambulation also. So for instance, and I've worked with a couple people like this, um, they might uh, have a knee that locks when they're upright. So at least it's not going to buckle on them. Uh, the, the gait isn't very good for a couple reasons, but at least it's not going to buckle. Uh, K2 is limited community ambulation, but not a need for variable cadence. Variable cadence is probably a misnomer, but what that actually means uh, for people with amputation is that uh, their gait velocity. So sometimes you're going slow, sometimes you're going pretty quickly. Uh, so people who need to do that are mostly the people who are employed uh, in using prostheses. Uh, so they would uh, need to be K3 and have components that will accommodate um, variable cadence. Uh, and K4 are high levels of activity such as running or other athletic uh, types of activities. Okay, so here's a protocol and this is from about 25 years ago. Um, the only thing that is kind of interesting, you know, different from what you actually encounter, uh, is uh, with um, this protocol, it has the person being discharged from the hospital five days after surgery. Uh, and I looked at um, the current literature, uh, and the current literature, at least for people with dysvascular uh, uh, amputations is that generally they're discharged 10 days after surgery. So this is kind of unusual that it would save five days because almost everything else in the world has gotten shorter. So there's less and less time that you can stay in the hospital for diagnosis, but this apparently amputation uh, has actually gotten a longer period. Anyway, uh, these are still decent objectives and decent things to do with people uh, immediately after amputation. So day one, working on bed mobility positioning, uh, don't touch the uh, amputated side, uh, but you can do exercises to the sound side, both for improving strength there uh, and for uh, improving some cardiovascular capacity. Day two, work on transfers, get them up sitting. Again, range of motion to the uninvolved joint actually. So for example, uh, if you were working with a patient with transtibial amputation, uh, you might have uh, the, the, the second, excuse me, the second day after the surgery, the patient doing uh, hip exercises. Day three uh, would be when you'd start getting them up. Actually, it says with walker, but probably with the parallel bars and probably just with parallel bars the first day. Increase your sitting tolerance, uh, continue to work. Uh, and in this case, I can actually start with them working with active range of motion on the involved joint. Uh, so uh, if they've had transtibular amputation, you're actually having to work uh, knee flexion and extension with the knee on that involved side. Okay, increase the amount of walking, increase the amount of sitting, 
uh, active range of motion. Still more exercise to the non-amputated side than the, ex the amputated side. Uh, and then education uh, about contracture and other precautions. Okay. Increasing their endurance and their strength as time goes on. Uh, and the Gailey Protocol, and the Gailey is named for Robert Gailey, uh, who is um, probably the physical therapist who's done the most research uh, about um, you know, rehabilitation of people with amputation uh, and using prostheses. According to that protocol, uh, they are discharged five days after. However, according to the CDC, the average length of hospital stay after this dysvascular transtubular amputation is nine or 10 days. Okay, so here they would definitely be discharged by this point. Uh, the rigid dressing would be changed if it has not fallen off already. Uh, you assess ambulation skills with an assistive device you know, outpatient. Uh, keep up with the dynamic strengthening. And review education. Okay, so the next thing uh, that as a preparer for using the prosthesis that has to be done uh, is what's called construction of a check socket. So I'm going to stop the screen share now because I have something I think that is important to, sh to show you. Uh, and we looked at this once before. But this is um, a cast. This is a plaster cast from a patient, but this has been heavily modified. So you see the, the patella is right here, and this here is called the patellar bar. Uh, we encountered the patellar tendon bearing orthosis before, which also had a patellar bar, but the reason for this here is a patellar tendon uh, is very strong and flexible. It's a great weight bearing structure. Uh, and this does actually, I'm gonna turn it on its side so you can see, uh, this is the medial side right here. Uh, but this actually does not look exactly like a person's shank uh, after transtibular amputation uh, because what they've done, what the prosthetist has done, uh, is augmented uh, the, the positive mold or the positive cast uh, on the uh, pressure sensitive side, like here, for instance, uh, is where the fibular head lives. Uh, and uh, then uh, taken away uh, material so there'll be more pressure uh, like here and here on the uh, anterior proximal tibia uh, which are really pressure tolerant areas. So this is not exactly the shape although this would be the shape of the inside of the socket. Uh, and the reason I wanted to show this to you at this point because the next thing that I wanted to talk about is called the check socket. Okay, so the fellow in the picture here is a prosthetist or a prosthetic technician, uh, and what he's doing is creating a check socket. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Brent to see if he can bring one in uh, when he meets us for the first time in a couple weeks. Uh, but a check socket is a very clear plastic. Um, you couldn't use it as an actual socket because it's way too fragile. Uh, but the prosthetist, uh, will construct this socket based upon uh, a positive mold like we were looking at before. Uh, and then the patient comes in and uh, actually will stand within that socket. And the prosthetist then can look uh, for areas of on the one hand, uh, not enough contact, but on the other hand, too much pressure uh, between the residual limb and the socket. Uh, and if he or she finds that, then they need to redesign the socket before they uh, give that to the people. And they would go through the whole process again, uh, doing a check socket of like, a very clear um, polyurethane, I think, before actually, um, actually issuing the prosthesis itself.
Okay, so week three, staples removed, continuing with exercise. Week four, uh, we're kind of healing. Uh, and this is what we were talking about at CAS4. The check socket is also called the diagnostic socket. Uh, so probably a patient would do that um, six or eight weeks after the original surgery. Uh, and start with prosthetic gait training, uh, 10 or 11 weeks. Uh, the cardiopulmonary cardiovascular training is really important. And we'll talk about that for just a second, uh, because remember, they're no longer getting muscular support uh, from the limb that has been amputated. Uh, so uh, the energy cost of ambulation has really increased. So they really need to have the cardiopulmonary reserve in order to become community ambulators or meet uh, the highest potential level that they're going to be able to achieve. Okay, so here are some pictures. So uh, if a patient has transtibial amputation, uh, and, and generally if anybody can have uh, any problem with knee flexion, you don't, for goodness sake, want them to rest with the pillow underneath the knee. Uh, here's a patient with transhemoral amputation, and as I said, you know, they are the one uh, patient population that actually uh, can suffer from abduction contractures and have it be a big problem. Uh, and that probably because the, um, the abductor magnus has not been myelodesed back to the femur. Um, but what is recommended here uh, is just not to tempt uh, the ability of a abduction contracture to form. So make sure that you're educating the patient to maintain uh, a deduction with the thigh while resting. Uh, here's a fellow in a wheelchair and uh, what um, uh, Casey and Liz saw is with that splint that he had, this was actually really helpful for keeping the knee in extension. Okay, so again, here are just some uh, exercises for stretching in this case. Uh, for strengthening, it's got a picture of a glute set of uh, chair push-ups uh, for people perhaps who are not strong enough uh, to use an, an assistive device like walker. Quad sets, uh, and this is actually uh, bridging, but they have it, the patient doesn't have a left foot, so uh, in, on the left side, in order to get hip extensor strength, uh, she's got her uh, residual limb up on a towel. Hip abduction, hip extension, uh, working the hip adductors asymmetrically. And again, like I said, just some ideas for you in case you uh, are in a circumstance where you need to work with these patients. Knee flexion, knee extension. Okay, uh, now here is the, uh, this might be just the second chat question uh, of the afternoon. Uh, functional progression. So this has a functional progression, uh, and what I would like you to think about uh, is how do these get harder? How is quadruped harder than long, sit, long sitting, and how is high kneeling the hardest part of all? And I'll keep going through some exercises. But again, I want you to think about this question. In fact, we'll stop when I get to um, uh, the pictures that are designed to illustrate this point. But you can go ahead and chat at any point. Oh, okay, we've got some chance already. Good. Very good. Okay. So the base of support is getting smaller. And what's happening to the center of mass? Go ahead, chat me some more. 
Okay, yeah, this is actually a really good picture. So we see uh, the patient here doing some pulley exercises uh, in a long sitting position, uh, then in the quadruped position, uh, and then in a, um, a sitting actually on a, a rolling, oh, it looks like some sort of tube. Uh, but something that is unsteady, so they have to depend upon trunk control to control it. So you see this is easiest, again, because of lowest basis support. Here, this is a little more challenging because the basis support is higher. Uh, and here is the most challenging of all, uh, because on the one hand, they got the basis support. On the next hand, they've got this um, thing that can roll back and forth. Uh, again, uh, a bunch of drawings just uh, recommending some exercises. Okay, so what do you want to see uh, if your patient has just had uh, amputation? And this is what you'd look for uh, after transtibular amputation. Okay. Um, now, I am not sure if you're familiar with the expression brim. I think we've mentioned it a couple times, but I think it's an unfamiliar idea enough that I ought to stop and show you what we mean by brim. Okay, so I have here a transtibial prosthesis, uh, and we speak of the socket like we speak of a bucket. So. This is the medial side over here. And so this is the medial brim, posterior brim, lateral brim, anterior brim. And you see that the patellar bar is kind of built right into the anterior brim of this prosthesis. Share my screen again. Okay. Uh, so you want to make sure that when the person is sit seated like here that the residual limb is not forced out of the socket. If it does, then probably the problem is that the posterior brim is too high, uh, and nor does the suspension loosen. Suspension is how the prosthesis is held to the person, him or herself. Okay, so when they're standing, uh, you want symmetry. You want the pylon to be vertical. And you're watching out for gapping. By gapping, uh, what is meant um, here, let me show that device to you one more time. So what is meant by that is if the patient is standing, is there space at all between the basins? Um, more proximal limb on the amputated side and the brim of the prosthesis. Okay, uh, now this is uh, uh, not what you might think at first. This is actually a socket liner. Uh, for a patient who has a uh, transfemoral amputation. And we'll talk about this in just a little bit. Okay, uh, now we have an example of a suction socket. Uh, I'm gonna look at your faces because I want to see if anybody in their first um, couple of internships uh, has worked with patients who have had amputation uh, and are learning to use prostheses. So I'm going to look at faces. Give me a thumbs up for a minute if you've had that experience, okay? Whoop. I thought maybe I saw somebody in the first row. Anybody in first row? Second row, thumbs up. Third, oh, no, okay. Uh, Bree gave me a thumbs down. Oh, Andrew has, really? Okay, so Andrew, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Elizabeth has, uh, in addition to the patient that we, Elizabeth, in addition to the patient that we met uh, a couple days ago. 
Okay. Well, okay, so um, was it a patient with transtibular or transfemoral amputation? Uh, transfemoral. Okay, so in Andrew's case, transfemoral. How about you, Liz? Transtibial. Okay, so Andrew, I'm going to talk with you. Uh, do you remember what kind of suspension, uh, what kind of method of keeping the uh, the prosthesis to residual limb that person used? I mean, I don't remember the exact mechanics other than he used to have this like spray. He used to actually always spray down this component right as he was attaching the limb. Okay, I bet, uh, Andrew, that he had something a lot like this. Uh, so what this is, is a silicon socket liner um, that a, a patient with femoral amputation would put on their residual limb uh, and then these ribs would make uh, a vacuum uh, as they pushed it in and help to keep the, uh, the prosthetic socket on their residual limb. Uh, now, when I was early in my career, uh, the best thing was a suction socket and the suction socket uh, would actually be between the skin of the person, him or herself, uh, and the inside of the prosthetic socket. Uh, that isn't done very frequently anymore, Brandt says, because these are so good and they're actually safer anyway. You're, less, you're of less of a risk uh, of getting a scratch and getting potentially infection from that. Okay, uh, so again, what you're interested in is, is it suspended securely? So it doesn't come off or begin to come partially off when the person sits down. And also one of the things that is a problem some of the time is that the anterior brim of the socket is so long that the patient really cannot sit down because uh, the anterior brim will hit them right in the groin. Okay, so if the person is standing, again, you're checking for the socket to fit properly uh, and for the knee to be stable. Now, I actually have some text here, but that sounds perhaps kind of biomechanisty. Um, I, I want you to think, uh, and I think we talked about this before, but I want you to think for just a minute about what makes a knee stable in standing. So go ahead, think about that, uh, and then let me know. What makes a knee stable in standing? Go ahead and chat. Okay, so a few people are saying the answers. Okay, so yeah, the screw home mechanism. So some people are saying the screw home mechanism or ligamentous tautness. Uh, and all those happen uh, in what posture of the knee? Go ahead, yell it out. Flexion or extension? Do you have those mechanisms uh, in flexion or extension? Uh, the screw hole mechanism, the ligamentous tautness, maximum joint congruency, flexion or extension. Chat me. Okay. So extension, that's right. Uh, and the reason it helps with extension uh, is because then the, like I said here, the axis of rotation is behind the line of weight bearing. Uh, and that's true with us, and it's true with people uh, with transfemoral amputation, that they have a mechanical knee hinge, uh, like people who are using a prosthesis, and if that hinge uh, is um, behind the line of weight bearing, which is represented with this white arrow uh, in the model here, uh, then the knee is held in extension just by the passive force. 
uh, one more thing that probably you hadn't heard of is an adductor roll. Well, an adductor roll is kind of what it sounds like. Uh, remember that uh, for patients using sockets, and most patients use sockets, uh, they want with the transfemoral prosthesis to get right up uh, to the pelvis itself. Uh, however, if there is a roll of fat on the medial side, which happens actually frequently, uh, then they cannot because uh, the, that, that fat or that flesh is keeping the medial brim of the socket from actually touching the pelvis. So what that extra flesh is called is an adductor roll. I think I have an arrow here that would be there, although this particular patient looks to be pretty good and not have an adductor roll. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, the patient is beginning to wear the prosthesis. And how long the patient should wear that uh, depends upon their skin, soft tissue, uh, and whether the amputee, the patient, him or herself, is going to be too aggressive or not aggressive enough. We actually saw a patient a couple of years ago that, that was a bit too aggressive, really after uh, amputation, and he had to kind of rein him back in order to keep him safe. Okay, so this is how you might start, and this is how you might progress. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is now all posted on Blackboard. And here's a proposed schedule. Uh, what's really important uh, is inspecting the skin often. There's a few places that you expect to see perhaps some skin breakdown. Uh, with patients with transtibial, um, the strongest pressure uh, is at the anterior distal end of the trivia that has been transected. Uh, there's also a pressure area a lot of times on the bottom. Um, you'll see this, but uh, people who have uh, what's called a, a pin and shuttle lock suspension, that pin is on a big metal disc. And so some people can be black and blue under weight, under, uh, on the skin that is weight bearing into the socket through that disc. Okay, so that's how you progress with the walking. And with transfemoral, we have a similar situation. Okay, now you can expect uh, changes in uh, skin and soft tissue uh, integrity if the person gains weight, uh, then might not only the prosthesis fit more poorly, poorly uh, but um, they're going to have higher pressures and torx. Uh, same thing if they go from something like a walker to a cane. Higher pressures and torx, changes in the volume. Uh, if the change is great enough, uh, then they have to actually redo the socket. If the change is small, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, uh, but there is the socks. And you know, we have a couple of examples of those on campus someplace. I can't find them right now, but they're actually pretty intuitive. Uh, what they are is just fabric socks, you might even call them, that go um, over the residual limb and help fill in space uh, when the residual limb is smaller because of control of edema. Okay. Uh, and these are the issues with socks. So um, the good thing about socks is that you can add them as the day goes on because what tends to happen a lot of times is the person is weight bearing uh, is that the pressure will decrease uh, or the, the swelling will decrease because of the weight bearing um, that is moving the pressure out or if the person is more acute, a swelling may increase with the time of day and how much they have had to bend it, in which case you would take away a ply of socks. So the socks 
uh, come in from very thin, and the very thin is called the single ply, to the very thick. Uh, and I think the thick ones are up to about 10 ply. So they are actually 10 times uh, thicker than the first one. Uh, and the, again, the good thing about them is that they are adjustable depending upon the circumstance that somebody is facing with their prosthetic limb. Okay, uh, now one more trick uh, that I've used that I think uh, you should think about uh, if you're going to be working with these people. Uh, take a little ball of Play-Doh, roll it up about the size of a pea, uh, and put it on the bottom of a prosthesis. And this can be true for transtibial or transfemoral. Uh, usually, though, transtibial don't have too much of a problem uh, getting their residual limb to the bottom of the socket. However, a lot of times it really is a problem uh, for patients uh, with transfemoral amputation. So either transtibial or transfemoral, try the ball Plato trick if they're making, if the residual limb is making it all the way to the bottom of the socket, uh, then it will squash that ball Plato. Okay, just a couple things regarding gait training that I want to show you. Okay, here's a review of the phases of gait according to Rancho Los Amigos uh, and the different things that you're trying to achieve. So for instance, the first thing that happens is the uh, initial contact, loading response, mid stance, terminal stance, pre-swing, um, initial swing, mid swing, and terminal swing. Okay, uh, and with this lady over here, uh, and this is, you can see, this is some very old technology. So uh, these are repeated uh, photos, uh, and rather than having something that can actually measure the joint angles, what they did was they just drew on the photographs. Uh, but it shows you the difference during swing uh, between the sound side and the involved side. Over here, uh, uh, what we see is a person who had transfemoral amputation and is early in her rehab. You see, uh, such as a lot of people do, when wagering on the surgical side, it lean way forward. They do that to see if they are able to take um, any pressure off the knee. However, as the person became more of an expert prosthesis user, uh, we've got, mm, we've got much less asymmetry. Okay, and that will do us for today. I'll end my screen share. All right, we're just a couple minutes over, uh, but um, uh, I will stick around for a few minutes in case anybody has any questions about today's material, all right? Uh, otherwise, you can check out. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, have a good afternoon. Bye.